So welcome to week 21 um, of our Survive and Thrive webinar series, which we've been running in collaboration with Gatwick Diamond Business. Um, my name is Daisy and I'm the Community Manager at Sussex Innovation Centre in Falmer. With me today we have Anya from Eshcon, who you may have seen a couple of weeks ago at our female founders webinar. Um, Steve from Creed Management Consulting, who is a friend of the Innovation Centre, and Darren from Sea Level, who is one of our members, uh, but is currently out in Portugal. Um, so he's going to be telling you a bit about what he's doing out there later on. Um, if we think back to deepest, darkest lockdown, all of a sudden the whole country kind of went into a massive behavioural change. Um, some people weren't allowed out of the house at all. Some of us were allowed out for our one hour's exercise or to just buy essential items, um, which seemed to be a lot of toilet roll apparently. Um, but it meant that we kind of, we weren't traveling about as much as we used to, which led to a huge drop in carbon emissions. Um, but scientists have said that the actual impact of this on the climate crisis has been negligible, um, which means that we've all got um, We've still got a responsibility as individuals to try and lead more sustainable lives and kind of maintain some of these behavioural changes that we saw throughout lockdown. Um, what about businesses? So that's what we're here to talk about today. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to pass you over to Steve. Ah, well, I'll just uh, put my share screen up and uh, hopefully I won't have any uh, technological challenges, but but if I do, I do apologize in advance. Right, well, um, as uh, Daisy said, welcome to Survive about 10 or so minutes to explain sustainability to you. That's uh, probably a big task, so I'm gonna do my best to uh, make it as uh, straightforward and simple as possible. Um, just a bit about myself. Uh, as Daisy said, I'm, I'm actually a, a, a um, innovation advisor at uh, SYNC part-time, as well as being an independent consultant working with businesses uh, and social enterprises on how they can integrate sustainability into their strategies. Uh, I've been doing sustainability for around 25 years now. Um, so I've got a fair bit of background that um, helps me to share how things come uh, together and defining what sustainability really is all. Um, I think one of the things that came out of it was that businesses with purpose really seem to be able to do better. Um, and I would define a business with purpose as one which takes their employees, thinks about their employees first, um, leads from the front, uses actions uh, rather than words to show what they're really doing, is authentic with how they talk about things, and is always looking to the future. And I think that if you adopt sustainability as a way of going forward, then you can use all of those things to make your business more sustainable. And at the same time, I think um, in the very basic meaning of sustainability, you can be a much more um, long living organization. But first of all, hang on, what's going on? I need to get to the next slide. There we are. Sorry about that. Um, what does sustainability mean to you? Well, I expect it means a little bit different to everybody. Um, these are some of the meanings that I've come across over the years that I've been accepted. The challenge is how do you define it? Now let's step back in history a bit and look at how sustainability has uh, come to pass and where it first started. Well, I mean, it really started in the 70s. Uh, I'm not really gonna go back that far. Um, I'm going to talk more about First of all, when I first really became aware of sustainable development is around 1987, when uh, the United Nations published a report called Our Common Future. And in it, um, there was a sentence that said that sustainable, so sorry, sustainable development is that which meets the needs of the present without uh, compromising the ability of future uh, generations to meet their own needs which highlights the fact that we're here as stewards of the planet rather than just users of its resources. And we need to think like that. Now, the first diagram there, which uh, often you see is the three interlinking circles. Now, obviously during COVID being a economically viable 
company was an important part of it, but equally caring about the social equality of people was really important and it brought out equality there as well. And finally, being environmentally sound was important. More recently, um, the United Nations in 2015 worked with the countries in the world to develop something called the Sustainable Development Goals, um, which again can be did into those three pillars and they've got uh, 17 in all. Uh, it's quite a big package, there's 169 targets. They're trying to make it happen by uh, 2030. Uh, again, I'd say it was a good place to look for a bit of inspiration in what you might be able to do to be more sustainable. There we are, get that right. But you can't do it with just thinking about where you're going to act because surrounding a business is going to be the economic, the economies that make these things work. And one of the, the main things that's come out is the idea of a circular economy uh, that was developed uh, over in the 70s originally, but it really came to, to a head in um, about around 2010 when Ellen MacArthur Foundation showed their ideas of how circular economy was so important. The point being that we currently live in a linear economy where we, we make things, well, we use resources, we make things out of it, and then we throw it away. Unfortunately, there is no way. Uh, and in nature, everything, there is no waste in nature because everything is found a place and is part of how it all works. So if we take a tree, it grows, the leaves fall off, they decay, new trees grow. There's no waste in there. Um, and that's ultimately how we can get to a point where we can minimize the use of the resources and meet that concept of sustainable development where um, we only use the resources we need and we use them very sparingly. Recycling is an important part of it, but it isn't really a circular economy. Um, the problem with that sort of concept is the social side of it is a bit limited. And uh, someone called Kate Roworth has developed a, something called the donut economy. I mean, donut economy, isn't that interesting? Um, there's a diagram there that explains it where essentially the outer side of the donut is the uh, limits of the Earth's uh, capability. So we have climate change, which you're probably going to talk about a fair bit today, and environmental impact, for example, air pollution, that sort of thing. And then on the inside, we have all the kind of requirements for a, a, everyone to have an equitable life. So that's kind of bringing the social and the environmental impacts together. And the idea is that we all want to live in the soft, squidgy bit in the middle of the donuts, bit we really like to eat as well. So that's where we all want to be. Um, and the donut economy defines a way of getting there. I'm not going to go into too much detail because obviously time's limited. There's also legislation pushing us in this direction. Um, back in, 20, in 2008, the government passed the climate change legislation and they um, basically committed to reduce our carbon emissions by 80% by 2050. That's a big challenge uh, for uh, the UK as a country. Uh, I think we maybe hear a bit more about those kind of ideas. I'm not sure Darren might be talking about that, I'm sure. And you will in the um, stuff to do with the uh, um, uh, 14,001, that sort of thing. Um, there's another uh, publication, which is uh, the England strategy for waste. Um, I don't know if you know, but uh, environment is devolved. So Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland and England all have slightly different strategies. Reminds me of some other things that are going on at the moment. Uh, but the England government published their, or well, the UK government for England published their latest waste strategy, our waste, our resources, a strategy for England. Um, this has got some really interesting ideas in reducing the amount of waste we create. It also highlights some legislation to do with things like deposit return on packaging and uh, other things, and possibly even extended producer responsibility where individual people, say like Coca-Cola, have a responsibility to ensure their packaging is subsequently recovered. It's, it's a little bit too, um, if you like, recycling economy rather than circular, but they do talk about it in there. So well worth a read. Also the uh, European Union, um, unfortunately we're leaving, that's my view, but uh, not everyone's. But uh, the point is we did adopt a lot of their um, circular economy action plan um, before we left. So it's essentially in the U UK law as well. Now, the big question that you're all gonna be asking, I think is in these times when we're all under pressure uh, and particularly economically, is this going to be a viable thing for me to do? 
Um, well, uh, there was a recent survey by um, QMS and admittedly it was before COVID, but at that point, 74% of the businesses felt that it was worth spending annually between one and 10K on things that were environmentally sustainable. So the, the thing is you can get improvements of, uh, your, for your business. I mean, basically things like uh, carbon emission reduction through using uh, low carbon uh, equipment or changing your procedures or just simply changing your lighting to LEDs from old style lighting components. Uh, you can also, well, you sent, mentioned early days, you mentioned things like reduced use of office. I mean, if you don't need so much office space, um, you can reduce your costs. It might also be helping you put your staff first because it might give them a better chance to um, get a life balance, not have to travel so much to work, which fits back into the idea of having a business with purpose. Um, risks, it can help you reduce your risks if you think about your whole supply chain. I mean, look what happened to Boohoo recently with their issues around dark factories. Um, you know, they really needed to take a take a, a stronger view on that. And clearly um, their actions were speaking louder than words because it had a big impact on their share prices. And then finally, um, opportunities. Well, Generation Z says that uh, studies suggest that 72% of them would spend more on a service that's uh, sustainably produced. And they're not very brand um, loyal as well. So here's an opportunity for you maybe to steal a bit of market and, and look to the future with opportunities that you might build in for them. So those are the kind of things, but you don't want to necessarily not say what you mean because it's important to be authentic. I mean, McDonald's got into a lot of trouble last year because they replaced their plastic straws with paper straws um, and they called them, um, let's word here, eco-friendly, they said. Unfortunately, the straws had to be made very thick to handle their products. And so they weren't very easily recycled. Um, and you can imagine how quickly the press got onto that and uh, called them out for supposedly doing something uh, eco-friendly, but not. And then finally, I'm not gonna talk about this very much, but the important thing about the journey is start small. Don't try to do too much in the beginning, but get started. Prioritize the actions that you might wanna take. Set some annual targets. Don't have to be very many, it might just be one and then measure what happens. And then finally, when you do meet your target, or even if you don't quite meet your target, but you make a change, don't be shy about telling people about it. Look at what's going on and go through the whole cycle again. So that's sustainability in about 12 or 13 minutes, I think. I hope you found that useful. I've also included a list of um, resources on the slides that you might wanna look at later. Um, and that's it. Thanks very much. Thank you, Steve. That was a fantastic introduction. Um, so if anyone has got any questions for Steve, please feel free to pop those in the Q&A or the chat and we'll come back to those later. Um, it's interesting you're talking about the circular economy. Um, obviously on the last webinar that me and Anya are on, um, we were also talking to Ron Brophy, um, who is just starting up um, a new circular economy business um, in the Brighton area. So again, available on our website to watch later, if you're interested in that. Um, I'm now going to pass over to you though, Anya. Great. Great. Thank you, Daisy. And thank you, Steve. That was a really good introduction. So just sharing my screen now, so hopefully you can see, uh, see all that. So um, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Anya Ledwith from Eshcon Environmental Management Consultancy. And I wanted to share uh, the fact that Steve has given us a, a really good introduction from the, the wider um, uh, concept of sustainability, but actually how do you get started? So I wanted to just share three simple ways that you can um, put the environment into your business, but actually raise your profile as well. Uh, make sure my screen is working. So again, Steve has um, shown, shown um, the relevance uh, of uh, sustainability. But I just wanted to share three very quick facts with you, just to show the environmental connection with business. So we quite often think about environment about ourselves as an individual, maybe a consumer, but actually, how does that affect your business? Well, firstly, cost of energy. Cost of energy is always rising, 46% uh, over the last 
five years as the cost of electricity, gas has gone up even more. So even if you don't care about the environment, you care about your costs and your financial planning. So just think about that from that point of view. Air pollution and traffic. Um, I've, I've just put a, a simple stat there that, that a lot of cities and towns are trying to develop quiet routes to try and avoid very congested areas and reduce air pollution. And they think that air pollution, localised air pollution, so the stuff that you're breathing on, in on a, a daily basis, is reduced by 20% just by choosing low traffic areas. And of course, think about um, uh, getting out of the car and starting to walk and cycle, etc. That helps to reduce air con um, um, congestion and air pollution. And then lastly, why are, why are businesses getting into the environmental, um, environmental management? Well, most of it is because customers are demanding it. And I refer to here uh, at a Grant Thornton piece of research that they did uh, a couple of years ago involving 1,000 companies across the world, large and small. And they found that 62% of those companies started on their environmental journey because customers were asking for it. And these were mostly in the B2B supply chain. But it does affect individuals as well. So if you're B2C, even more so. So I just wanted to start with painting a picture. Quite often when we talk about environmental, climate change, pollution, etc., we think about negative images, you know, the Australian wildfires. Um, the, the, uh, the, there's an oil tanker that's broken up off the shores of Mauritius just last week, so spreading oil and pollution everywhere. And yes, these negative images are important. These, these things are important, but I try to think about positive side of things. So I just wanted to share maybe some of my holiday snaps. No, not quite holiday, but some photos of things that I've taken from that I see out and about when I'm out on my walks, when I'm working, working in town, working with my clients as well. And I just want to show you this beautiful, co complex, wonderful world that we live in. And we are interacting with it on a daily basis as an individual, but as a business as well. So this is something that we should embrace and be grateful for. And we have a place in it to protect, shall we say. But again, it comes back to the opportunities. And from the COVID point of view, people are be becoming more mindful about the impact of their purchases. So 65% are saying they're, they're thinking about the purchases post lockdown, but it's not just this knee jerk reaction. 80% of people have changed their purchasing habits, habits in the last 12 months to consider environmental and also social issues as well. So there is this great opportunity. It's not just about fluffy bunnies or tree hugging, although I have been known to hug a few trees and got some great photos as well. I'll show you those with you next time, perhaps. But again, just to give you a little bit of background of who I am, my story starts age 10, sitting on the floor, watching Life on Earth, watching David Attenborough, and thinking, wow, what a fantastic world we live in. But I realise that it's complex. So I have developed this mission to make environmental management the business norm. And that's what I want to share with you today. So environmental management is all about understanding, managing and improving your environmental impact. So that could be energy, waste, the materials you're using, transport, water, pollution control. All of these things at, at the centre is requires considered management approach. And you may think that's just for big business, but actually this applies to small businesses as well, because all organisations can reduce their impact, improve efficiency and find those important cost savings. And I've just shown a little stat here that a lot of companies are able to make 20% savings in energy. And if you think about how that affects your bottom line, that's the equivalent of a 5% increase in sales. So how much effort do you have to put into the or increase in sales to get that saving, to get that um, impact on the bottom line? And again, if you think you're too small to make a difference, you've basically never been in bed with a mosquito. You can have a difference, even if your small cumulative actions will have an impact on this beautiful, wonderful world we live in. 
I won't go through the wings of environmental management too much because Steve has, has talked about all this before in terms of reducing risk, planning for the future, savings, um, meeting customers' criteria to help you win business. But I also wanted to point out the personal benefits, the benefits to you. If you do this within your business, there's an opportunity for personal growth, for career development as well. But it is scary to get started. So most organisations, they just don't know where to start. So this is where I'll, I'll, I'll share with you today very quickly. I try to do things from with a, a nudge theory to start small, but you just gain rapid momentum. But I'll guide you through the process to make sure that it is relevant, it's interesting and rewarding to you as well. So it's really important to your business, but useful for you as an individual. Just a couple of examples here. I won't go through them all in details, but hotel kitchens, we're looking at gas savings in the kitchen from behavioural and operational changes. And yes, they save gas, they save energy, but it's actually cooler for the staff working in the kitchen, so it's actually more pleasant. An electronics firm, they save a thousand pounds and three tonnes of carbon a year on changing their equipment and lighting. Um, one of their members of staff had eye strain from the really poor quality lighting before, so that was an extra benefit as well. Kent University saved 3,000 tonnes of CO2 every year, um, down 17% despite the fact that they're actually growing in size. Elvis and Cress, the, they are a, a handbag manufacturer and they use fire hoses that would have been thrown away as their raw material. And they think one tonne of waste is um, transferred into a hundred thousand pounds of value. That's quite a quite an undertaking. And then lastly, Forster Communication, uh, they're a PR agency. They do an awful lot of environmental um, activities, but 37% of their staff commute by bicycle to work. So this is really at the core of their business and they see this as their USP. So I want to share just three things of how you can get started and how you can make it easy for your customers to buy from you for having this information and you can share that as well. So start with your carbon footprint. What are your carbon emissions? So you want to understand what your environmental impacts are, your carbon and your costs. And the best thing to do is gather 12 months of data. So your electricity, your gas, the waste you're producing, your company cars or vans or planes or train travel, etc. Everything, just gather this data. It could be kilowatt hours of gas, miles travel, tons of waste produced. And you use that to calculate your carbon footprint, which is given in a single figure of tons of CO2 E. And to give you an idea of quantity, what we're talking about here is one ton of carbon dioxide would fill a hot air balloon. So try to visualize that. I've just done a, a carbon footprint for, for one company. Their, their carbon footprint was 820 tons of CO2. 820 hot air balloons floating in the Sussex uh, uh, air, shall we say. That's the equivalent of 271 return flights to the USA. So if you use that figure, you can understand and quantify what we're talking about. But you use your carbon footprint to identify where you need to focus. So if you find that 80% of your carbon footprint is arising from business travel, that's where you want to focus to help reduce those, those, um, your business travel and reduce those impacts. And then set a target for reduction. It could be a net zero target, so people are talking about going net zero, so, so effectively uh, nullifying their carbon emissions over a 5, 10, 20 year period. Or you could set a reduction target for one year, two year, three year period. It's up to you just to make it relevant for you. Next stage I would recommend is develop an environmental policy. And you can use that to, um, to share with your stakeholders and with your customers, but it shows that you're committed to managing your environmental impacts. But a policy can be rather dull, so make, make sure it's relevant to your business and interesting to your reader, particularly so they'll want to learn more about you. So you've set your targets, you've got your policy, how are you going to actually achieve your reductions? You could go for a more informal environmental action plan, 
or maybe a more formalized environmental management system. And most are um, certified to the international standard ISO 14001. I'm not going to go into detail there. This is a whole, whole webinar in itself. But I'm really pleased that Steve said that you need to share what you're doing with people, with your staff, with your customers, etc. So the best thing to do is to run a workshop and get your staff involved, get them to identify improvements that could be energy saving, like lighting, waste reduction, recycling, planning your, your business travel, and come up with ideas that are behavioral, operational, and technical changes. You can also consider carbon offsetting as well, if you want to go carbon free, or if we want to go carbon neutral, and uh, Darren will talk about that a little bit later but particularly raise the profile of what you're doing. So publicize your work internally with staff projects and, and competitions, really get people involved, but externally as well, you know, put it on your website, enter the awards, you know, be the green business of the year. You know, how, how fabulous would that be? Basically shout about your carbon reduction target and what you're doing to achieve it. This is a great opportunity to communicate with people. So really exciting opportunities for you now. If you need help, just drop me a line, drop me an email. I've got a couple of fact sheets that I can share with you. 15 top tips on how to reduce your energy waste, water and transport, but also how to write a really great environmental policy. So drop me a line, I can help you with that as well. Thank you. And back to you, Daisy. Fantastic, thank you, Anya. That's really useful, practical tips there um, and as I mentioned I'll be sharing um, everyone's slides after this and I'll share your contact details for the board attendees. If you've got any questions for Anya while we're live then please pop those um, in the Q&A or the chat. Um, I've seen there's been a, a bit of chat going on here. I think um, David put a question in but it was only visible to panellists so I'm just going to share that um, with everyone before we go to you Darren. Um, so David's asked um, what are your views on, one, the development of the business case for nature, and two, the emergence of a sustainability-related license to operate, um, to which Darren has replied. Um, good question. Um, actually, this is probably visible to, everywhere, uh, mm. to everyone, um, but B Corp is pushing this kind of agenda. Um, did you, I don't know if you want to talk a bit little about that, Darren, briefly now. Uh, kind of your response. Yeah, maybe uh, it's well, just I mean, a quick it's, explanation of what B, B Corp is. This might everyone might uh, know. Yeah, I'll, I'll cover it in my presentation. But B Corp, um, C level is a B Corp certified business, and it's something that I'm I'm very proud of. Um, we it, it's a difficult thing to achieve, um, and the nice thing about it is is speaking to David David's question is that when you go through this whole process and you, and you you meet the benchmark and you you can, uh, can join the, the B Corp community and achieve certification and carry the logo. Um, the last step in it is to, is to change your legal docs um, so that you benefit, so the directors have a legal responsibility to all stakeholders, which in our case, we just, the, the stakeholder that we're concerned about is the whole living planet. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a responsibility to the whole biosphere. And it's obviously, it's fundamentally a, a massive shift from being obliged to run a business for the benefit of just share, financial shareholders. So I would say, and, and what we're doing in the B Corp community at the moment, and B Corp isn't, you know, it isn't some, you know, it isn't a small um, concern. You know, we've got uh, companies like Ben and Jerry's in uh, Patagonia, um, as well as a lot of smaller businesses. It's growing rapidly in the, in the UK. With, with with you know a good number of members now um yeah and it's really it's really we're really pushing for this to be not just something that happens for b corp certified businesses but it happens for all um companies in company law in the uk so i would call that a license to operate responsibly um, it's it's definitely aligned with where we need to go for the future and it's quite radical so um i love b corp and El elvis and cressy who you referred to and yeah, um, are, 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 are really good. They're also B Corp certified uh, and indicative of the kind of kind of companies that take the trouble to do it, really. Thank you. I don't know if anyone else had anything 
from the panel that they'd like to add to David's question? Yeah, I mean, B Corps is, is the pinnacle. Um, but I would say a lot of organisations aren't ready for, to, for going for that. So uh, starting, starting small and working up. So in terms of, like, as I say, it's like calculating your carbon footprint, setting reduction targets, putting in uh, processes and systems. Um, most of my companies, most of my clients are putting in ISO 14001 uh, as a, as a formalised framework which will cover a wider uh, range of environmental impacts from uh, environmental activities, from waste, energy, water, carbon, et cetera, whatever is relevant to the organization. And biodiversity and nature will be, will be included in that as well. Thank you, Anya. Can I just say, Daisy, that- Yeah, um, please. Uh, David also asked about um, the business case for nature. And there's a, for me, that's a really interesting thing because it's, um, it's not easily quantifiable and it's dangerous maybe to quantify. So, you know, um, the business case for nature in the intuitive terms is, well, you know, we need pollinators for food, biodiversity is critical to the future. All these things are really important, but putting a price on it when you try to, because business cases usually end up with numbers that have some value to them. And the danger I think is that as soon as you try to put a price on something it's like I might sell it and so suddenly you kind of commodify something which I don't think should be so it's a really interesting space to understand how to create a business case for nature without somehow or other making it into yet something else that we're going to trade and buy options on and destroy as an unfortunate result of our desperate effort to prove to people that it's really important so it's a really interesting space to talk about we could talk about it for hours but uh, good point David. Thank you, Steve. Uh, thank you, David. There's a few more questions coming in, but I think if we um, go to Darren's presentation now, and there's, there's a couple more questions for you, Darren, which may okay. get answered part way through this. If not, we'll come to them afterwards. Yeah, I mean, I take Anya's point about um, B Corp being a pinnacle, you know, like a kind of uh, the high high ground of, of, of changing, you know, transforming a business. Um, and what I'd, what I'd say actually is that um, what most people call carbon offsetting and what sea level defined as carbon balanced when we found it in 2000 is, is actually the very, it's the very most basic um, and the very least that we can be doing. So it's kind of, yeah, it's a good intro to what I wanted to share with you. Um, it, it's all about doing something really simple and practical, which is use, working with nature to bring carbon down to earth or um, ma maintain the carbon stocks in, in the earth's systems. And when we talk about earth systems and, 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 and the biosphere, let's be really clear that, that the, the viability of earth systems and, and the biosphere absolutely underpins all the, all the secondary and tertiary systems you know, the financial systems, uh, you know, everything that all the, all the, every single business system that operates um, is, is, is dependent on the health, the real uh, wealth of the planet on this planet is the health of the planet. So um, although it's, it's very, you know, what sea level does with our carbon balance program, which is our original longstanding program, is, is very practical. It's about, you know, verifying and quantifying under a standard, the CO2 that can be achieved through through a project um you know there's there's, there's a much more a much bigger picture it's a very kind of holistic because we're working with the biosphere and with nature and with communities it's an extremely holistic approach um so what we my kind of intro into all of this um was first in sustainable management and um, sustainable development and then I saw climate change coming at the end of the 90s and, and at that point there were two companies that were talking about carbon offsetting. So I approached um, Future Forests, one of the companies, and joined that company. And after about a year, so this was like in 2000, after about a year, I realised that, um, you know, there was a better way to do it and there was a more holistic way to do it. Um, with greater in integrity. So that's, that was where we founded Sea Level. And the mission is still the same. It's to find and help, help communities develop the world's most holistic carbon offset projects. 
And the value triangle on this slide shows that we're always looking for action on carbon through verified and certified projects. So the, the, the standards are there, the quality is there. But we're always also looking for action on forests, either protection or reforestation. Um, and we're always doing it with communities. So we put people and indigenous communities at the heart of the carbon balance program. Um, this is what's unique about sea level and, and carbon balance certification. Um, it's more than neutral. It's more than offsetting. It's, it's, this, it's this three, the value, the value triangle has these three core um, benefits. Um, the, the, other, the other thing just to mention in kind of introducing sea level is that we, we, we also build, we're kind of smart with tech. So we've got tech capabilities uh, and programming capabilities to enable us to scale projects directly on the ground, um, but also to enable us to interface with, you know, the more complex systems that bigger clients like um, Skyscanners and Springer Nature run with. So th if they've got a travel provider, they'll be using the Concourse system or some other, uh, some other kind of travel booking system. So we've, we've, we've built an API, which basically enables our carbon calculators to be in automatic communication with, with other systems. Um, and interestingly, yesterday, up the mountain, um, I'm working on a devel the development of a project in Portugal at the moment, uh, and up the mountain, I got a call from IBM, you know, like um, w wanting access, immediate access to our balance API. And um, that now has, has turned into what looks like being a, um, a, a very positive uh, collaboration. So it's, uh, we're a small company, but the tech capability is important. The story, storytelling capability is important. We make micro documentaries to support our delivery partners on the ground um, and also to help our clients, our business clients, get really clear on the narrative, the sustainability narrative and the story that they're telling. So that's, that's kind of pretty much sea level. I've, I've talked about being B Corp certified. Um, and I've talked about all of this apart, apart from perhaps the fact that um, the very latest thing that's happening, which is in this presentation, along with, with some, some evolved branding, uh, is, is a new sister program that goes with our original carbon balance program. So, you know, as well as doing carbon footprint consulting and then helping choose the world's best products, uh, projects, uh, nature-based, community-based projects to achieve carbon balance certification, we've now got behind the scenes um, this Wild Align program. And the idea of this is to, it's very timely because we were working on this before COVID, um, but it's really about providing clients with the ability to go further. And um, so we're looking at, again, it's reforestation projects, indigenous reforestation projects, but we're trying to make it experiential for our clients so that people in business can actually roll up the sleeves and get involved either through a pro bono scheme or through actually getting involved in, in reforestation work on, you know, special kind of guided retreats that we would do. So these projects are European. Um, uh, it's why, why we're here now. And uh, I'd love to share a bit about how things are going over here uh, in a moment. I'm not going to talk about the clients that we work with. We, it ranges from innovative startups like Ocean Bottle. Uh, this is an Ocean Bottle. It's a amazing reusable bottle. It's got superb design criteria. Mm. It contains water at the moment. It could contain coffee. But these guys, again, in terms of new business models, Ocean Bottle are donating 50% of profits to the very dynamic Ocean Plastics charity called Plastic Bank. So their mission as a business, their purpose as a business, I've met the two founders, you know, they're, they're, they're a client, but their purpose as, as a business is to clean up the oceans. They're doing that through designing from scratch an amazing um, reusable bottle that means people don't have to buy plastic throwaway bottles. Um, and they're putting 50% of profits into a charity to help achieve their mission. And then on the other end, kind of end of the spectrum, we've got um, Springer Nature. These guys publish Nature magazine, Scientific American. They're simply the world's biggest academic publisher. Um, 1.7 billion turnover, 10,000 people 
and um, they spent over a year being very, very cautious about the kind of project that they would get involved to, to, to achieve carbon offsetting, to, to carbon balance their quite substantial footprint. And I'm pleased to say that we run a pilot and we're now progressing with um, a much, much bigger scheme, linking them to the amazing projects that we work with, which um, this is what a carbon footprint looks like for a client. Um, it's simply delivered. We don't get involved with spreadsheets or, you know, they're all there behind the scenes if needed. But um, we try and deliver our carbon footprint work. Um, you know, we, 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 I, I personally coined the phrase carbon footprint when we set up sea level. And the point of doing it was to make it easy to understand and, and easy to follow. So we try and do that in the way that we do the carbon footprinting work as well. This is a draft. Um, carbon balance certificate. So this is typically what the client would achieve. Um, we do the footprint, we, we link them up with the project, they finance the project, which, you know, they get the carbon balance certification. All of them are under Plan Vivo. So there's a standard involved. This is one of the smallest standards now, actually, um, but it stands for nature, climate and communities. So it's very closely aligned with our carbon balanced proposition. And it's the original carbon standard. I mean, the standard was formed from the world's first carbon offsetting project, which is called Skull El Te in Mexico, which is one of the six projects you'll still find on the sea level website. So, you know, you can go right to the source here, both in terms of the world's first carbon offsetting project and the world's first carbon standard. And the beauty of, of both of those is that um, they're, they're extremely balanced and holistic. It's some examples of other projects. I mean, I'd love to, the projects are what it's all about. And I'd, I'd love to talk in detail about all of these projects because they're all unique. Um, you know, we've got Mongolian nomads, we've got blue forest projects in Kenya, which are mangrove conservation projects. We've got the world's original carbon offsetting uh, project, Skol El Tay, you know, but anyway, time's of the essence. So this, this is just an example of one project. So, so this, this project um, is called Community. And uh, it's in Nicaragua. I, I would, it, 10 years this project's been running and it's typical of the way that we operate. I got a call from the founder, um, Khalil, 10 years ago. And he said, hey, we've got this, hey, Darren, well, you know, he's an American Canadian guy. And he said, we've got this amazing project coming up. Um, you know, can you get involved? Can you find us some buyers? We're gonna be generating Plan Vivo certificates, carbon credits. Uh, is there anything you can do? And I, I was tempted to say no, because we already had plenty of projects to represent. And in those days, it was quite hard to find companies to engage. So, but there was something about um, Khalil and his then vision, you know, nothing had happened. And I said, sure, if you can get this off the ground, we'll be there for you. So Community, his project is now the, the, the biggest reforestation project in the country, in Nicaragua. Three and a half thousand people are involved nearly a million tons of CO2 has been drawn down to earth. Five million trees have been planted. Millions are going into the communities and it's all been done using clever technology. So, you know, I love, I love this project. Um, Hadza Hunter Gatherers, winner of the UN Equator um, Award in 2019. This, this project beggars belief. This project is a carbon offsetting project, if, if, you, if you like to call it that. Is so much more, but it's it's working with a with a tribe of hunter gatherers. There's a thousand of the Hadza in the Yida Valley. Um, it's a, an area about the size of Dartmoor, about 320 square kilometers, and it's um, this is about basically trying to trying to hold on to the Hadza lands and stop deforestation. And the project's doing really well. Um, so so all of that is is about carbon balanced, and and I would say. It's the very least that we can do. It's super simple. Um, you make a start, you work out your carbon footprint, you look to improve on that through, through the years. You've got a baseline to reduce your carbon emissions, to reduce your footprint. But at the end of the day, once we've calculated a business's carbon footprint, there is nothing they can do about that apart from offset it. Um, so, and if, you're, and if you're gonna go down that route, which you definitely should, because we've got a climate crisis going on, then, uh, do it as holistically and, and with as much integrity as you can, because then you've got a really strong platform 
to communicate something that you're doing that you can be really proud of. And obviously, you know, all of your relationships internally and externally, all of the people who know about your business or know about your product, uh, you know, are gonna, are gonna be, are gonna recognize what's going on. Um, just very briefly, um, I've no idea how long we're doing with time, but I just wanted to, this is quite exciting um, for sea level. It's called Wild Aligned. Um, it's very much about when we set sea level up, our strat line was, was changing culture, not climate. And it's the changing culture bit has always been the most difficult thing to, to uh, get any traction with, with clients. Um, you know, clients like the idea of carbon balancing, but you know, it's, it's where do you go from there that is the interesting, interesting question, I think. And that was certainly, we wanted to use it as a kind of way to engage businesses with a sustainability metric carbon footprint. Um, so, you know, it's been, a, it's been a struggle to kind of achieve that kind of um, broader and, and deeper mission of transformation. Until, um, I would say, definitely pre-COVID, but until about a year ago, when we started getting clients saying, is that it? So we do the carbon balancing and they say, is that it? You know, what else can we do? How can we go further? Can we get more involved in these projects and in, in, in carbon balancing? So we started to, behind the scenes, pilot the idea and we were really kind of trying to find a way. Um, that now has crystallized into a program that is actually being piloted and funded by some of the more adventurous companies that we're working with. And I would say every single business that, that, that every single business that comes in to sea level now gets pitched to carbon balanced and wild aligned uh, as a sister follow on program. And I would say that every single business lights up when they, when they see that you've got the basic kind of stamp of approval, the least you can do, and then the way to go the extra mile. Not that everyone's engaging with it because it's, it's, you know, it's like, a, you know, do the first step and then maybe in the second year, look at doing, doing, uh, going further and going deeper. So just to clarify what we mean by this, it's, it's the value triangle for um, Wild Aligned is still action on climate and forest. So it's still about trees planted, but it's also about culture change, the transformation in people and businesses and doing all of that through experiential learning or direct involvement. And, um, you know, what we're trying to do here is, these, here's the examples. At the moment, we've got three projects that, that are lining up to, for, for clients to work with. Um, we've got Children's Forest in Britain. So this is basically, this is where Khalil and Community Tree were 10 years ago. This is three forest schools teachers. So the forest schools movement is doing really well in the UK. This is taking young children into a, into a woodland environment to, to learn um, forest school skills. It's a, it's a na nature-based education and it's doing, doing really well in Britain. So, but they, they only have a vision and they have a book, which is what this, this, this circular picture is of. Um, and when they approached sea level to, you know, could, could we help? Is there any way that we could turn it into a carbon offsetting project? You know, I said, no, but we can put it in the Wild Align program because it's about, you know, the value. It's about planting indigenous trees. It's about deep change. It's about experiential. It's for children, but obviously parents can get involved and businesses can get involved. And that's exactly what's happening with our pilot companies. And then we've got Forest Without Frontiers, which is kind of focused on the music and creative arts sector. It's a Brighton based initiative. It's a new charity. Um, it's in Transylvania, Romania. And this is about putting in wildlife corridors between pockets of, of old land. So it's wild aligned, you know, we mean, we need, we mean wild, wild within, with humans coming back and businesses coming back to the true nature, but also about indigenous reforestation, which can also be called rewilding. And rewilding from within is the Portuguese project, um, which is what we're working on here. Um, which is here. Um, so what we're trying to do with, with this project, so this is a retreat center in Portugal that was completely burnt out in 2017 by the fires. And since then they've rebuilt, um, but they've rebuilt around the idea of syntropic reforestation. So the whole burnt out valley now is being reforested in a very specific way, using indigenous trees and integrating um, food production into it. So the idea um, way back in, at the start of the year was to start to bring businesses to this site, which can accommodate up to 40 people. It's a, it's a very kind of top end 
uh, retreat center in nature, but it's it's got this reforestation work going on. So I was going to, with Matt McCartney, we were going to come over and then we were going to use the opportunity so that people could get involved from business directly, but also they could, um, you know, we could we could go deeper. We could we could sit together and you know reconnect. And since COVID, this is I think this has become so important that we actually come together experientially um, and and look at work that reconnects us both to each other but also to nature, which is the ultimate source of, of connection to everything. So uh, super excited about what's happening here, and the, and you know it, it involves a partnership with. Refloresta Portugal, which is a very dynamic NGO. So we've got pilot hub projects around Portugal uh, and sea levels role is as always is to kind of orchestrate businesses coming into this conversation, um, which I think is going to be fairly straightforward. Children's forest is superb. So yeah, I mean, I, I just, just to kind of wrap it up, um, it's, you know, the, the invitation really from, from me and from sea level and from, the projects that we represent, particularly through Wild Aligned, is to get more involved, go the extra mile, do the, do the carbon offsetting. We can help with that. We, you know, we can work with um, partners, you know, to to help with the carbon footprint if it's complicated. But you know, let's um, let's look at ways to to get more involved. And 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 just finally, you know, we're obviously really struggling with this whole, the whole idea of taking people places physically at the moment, which and, and the experiential part. So. A big um, insurance company has been talking to us for about six months and they wanted to switch their carbon offsetting to sea level because they weren't happy with the level of transparency that the current offset provider was providing. They really liked the transparency of sea level and the quality of the project. So we're doing that and it's great because they've got a massive carbon footprint. Um, but at the same time, they said, look, the other thing that's good about sea level is you know, we'd like to get more involved. We want to go further. We want to do more. How can we do it? Wild Align program. And, but in the absence of being able to bring them to Gravito in Portugal, or take them to children's forest projects around the UK, or take them to Transylvania, Romania. Um, sounds a bit dark, doesn't it? Transylvania, we will take you there. Um, you know, in the absence of physically being able to do that because of travel restrictions and all the rest, the conversation that's developed with with um, this insurance company, um, which kind of just it just it, the, the penny dropped, you know, everyone's online. So can we do an online course, a wild aligned experiential course online that is educational, it's sustainability training, but it, um, it you know, but people can also do practices that take them into nature or that bring people together in small groups. You know, how can we use Zoom if more effectively? How can we actually, you know, get people reconnecting the work that reconnects um, by running an online course? And we pitched this idea. We put seven modules together. So it was things like organizational, you know, good ways, good new models for, for redefining organizations, uh, well-being in the workplace, culture change in the workplace, um, what's really happening to the planet, regenerative systems, or, you know, all the kind of stuff that's, the kind of cutting edge of sustainability in businesses, put the seven modules together um, in a proposal to the insurance company. And they've got back and said, we absolutely love this. We want to put all of our staff, um, you know, so hundreds of staff through this program. So, so we've got a lot of work to do. We've actually now got to build this online course, but um, I think if, you know, as long as they follow through and they do find the budget that we've asked for, to help us, you know, to work in partnership, to collaborate, to develop this program, uh, this online course. And I think Wild Align will have the online presence as well, which will be really exciting. So that's, yeah, I'm sure I spoke for way more than 10 minutes. So I'm really sorry. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to cut you off now because yeah. we've got, um, that was fantastic. Thank you, Darren. Lots of really exciting projects. But I know we've got a couple of questions. I'm actually going to, um, one of them is from my colleague, Helena, who I'm actually going to promote to the panel. She can ask you. Uh, herself a question um, and she's also going to talk a little um, about kind of what we're doing at the Innovation Centre at the moment. She should be joining us any minute now as if by magic. Do I need to stop sharing so that she can join? Or... Oh yeah, no, there she is. 
Right. So you had a question for everyone, Helena, because it's just as a kind of final. I did have a question. Then I'll find the question now. I've been so busy listening to everything. <laughs> Um, yeah, so, so my, my question really was just, have you got a view as to whether you think that COVID has um, done anything to change people's behaviours that you think is going to stick in the medium term? And have you, in terms of your businesses, seen any changes in the number of people contacting you for your kind of services? Or, um, sorry, it's too polite here. That's what you don't realise before you go in. Um, or a difference in the type of companies that are now asking for services compared to pre-COVID? So has, has COVID changed anything here? Is my I'm very happy to talk to that. Well, um, I can, I can, I've been talking for a long time, so perhaps I should <laughs> <laughs> shut up for at least a minute. Well, I, I refer to the statistic I, I, I mentioned at the beginning of, of my presentation that people were uh, more aware of environmental issues because they're seeing um, traffic levels drop, cleaner air, they're either making use of their local environment, their local, you know, like just going for a walk around the neighbourhood, <coughs> around, around, the, uh, around the woodland. And, and people are more um, taking notice of what is around them and therefore showing more interest in them. Certainly I'm seeing more interest from um, businesses of all sizes. So while I have traditionally worked mostly with large companies and who are driven by legislation or customer, customer demand, I'm seeing small companies coming forward and they are being driven by their staff as much as by their customers as well. Mm -hmm. so, so that is an important thing so from, a, from a, uh, a recruitment and retention of good quality staff. You've got to reflect their values as well. Um. Just a quick thing for me. There's a couple of things. First of all, I think more people have had more time, which is why they've been able to get out and enjoy nature and things like that. But they've also done things like they started cooking from scratch more often. And the statistics show that there's been a big reduction in food waste, for example, during COVID-19. Now, whether they get their busy lives back and they stop um, cooking so much and the waste goes up, I'm not sure. But it's also happening in restaurants. I was talking to somebody who runs um, the, uh, uh, what's it called, um, Shelter Hall Raw at the moment, and they've opened up under COVID-19 arrangements and sort of with pop-up operations, and they're finding they have almost no food waste and very little excess as well. So they don't even use things like, um, uh, you know, uh, too good to go for things because they don't really have any more stuff left. So there's some interesting dynamics happening in the way that people are changing how they manage their businesses. And then from what's happening to me in terms of people I'm talking to, I'm talking to a lot more people who are being inspired by the challenges at the moment to create businesses that are quite innovative. So someone at the moment I'm working with is um, thinking about how we could gamify or use gamification to identify where litters are rising in order to provide information that would allow councils and people like that to be much more economic in the way they collect the litter. But it's not targeted at your average person who's worried about the environment. It's targeted at people who like things like Pokemon because the idea is you're gonna go around and take pictures and score points if you find different kinds of tins. And if they bring things like uh, extended producer responsibility into force, for example, then people like Coca-Cola will be desperate to know where all their tins and bottles end up. So they probably pay for that information. So, you know, someone has been inspired by what's happening with COVID and the situation we're in to actually create a really interesting, slightly disruptive technology that might really do something for the future. So watch out for people running around with their phones, trying to take pictures of litter before they put it in the bin. Got to, got to catch them all cans kind of thing. That's the idea. Yeah. And you get, you get <laughs> extra points if it's a, you know, and, and the other idea was they're thinking about using digital advertising. So you'd get a message about something that was relevant that you might want to buy and they could sell that as well. So it's, it's a really interesting concept. Interesting. Excellent idea. Uh, yeah, I just, I, so, I mean, I, I think we're basically, um, Daisy's just invited me on to say thank you very much to all of you. It's just, you know, I come on this web, this is the 21st week we've done a webinar, which blows my mind. Um, but it's, you know, I come on and I just feel so privileged to work with people like you for all your knowledge and your different approaches to subjects and your different areas of knowing. And I, and you know, I think 
all of us at the centre feel like that to be able to be in the orbit of people like you with the ideas you have. So I'm sure everyone's found it um, really valuable. And obviously we'll um, Daisy be sending out a follow up email um, tomorrow um, to try and find out if you've enjoyed it, what was useful, that kind of thing. Um, and if you want to connect to any of the speakers that you've seen today directly, you can. Or alternatively, you know, we're very much moving um, our thinking as a centre towards um, working with um, bigger companies who are more sustainable and uh, more purpose focused um, on societal issues, or environmental issues. So, um, you know, if you've got a company like that or you know somebody else has got a company like that, we ha have got these, these uh, wonderful uh, packages of EU funding at the moment that are available to, you know, give you a little taste of the, the support we can give people. Um, uh, at, at no cost to you. So if you, you know, if this has inspired you to think, you know, how could I make my company more sustainable, then do get in touch with us. I think Daisy's going to drop a link if you want to do that. Um, and or we'll, we'll get in touch with any of these guys direct. Um, but, you know, thank you. I just soak it all up every time I get to come to one of these webinars because it's such a privilege to, you know, have the, the stuff that you share with us. So thank you. Thank you from me too as well. Um, so it's, we're at the end of August and um, we're about to go into September um, and from September we are moving to fortnightly webinars. Um, so we won't see you next week um, but I'll be sharing details um, of our webinar on the 9th very soon so hopefully we'll see you there. And as Helena said thank you so much to our panel um, for today and for all of you for joining us. Right. Thanks very much. Thank Thanks you. A lot. Bye. Bye.